Nigel Warburton, A Little History of Philosophy. Narrated by Arian Stanley and Morag Sims. There are some questions the human mind is drawn to again and again. How should I live? What is truth? Should I fear death? And how should I treat others? These are questions that thinkers have grappled with for millennia, and their struggle to provide definitive answers has enriched and enlivened philosophy for years. Sadly, many readers are daunted by philosophy. Philosophers often write in obscure language and use highly technical terms. They build on their predecessors' arguments and often assume we possess extensive expertise. In short, philosophy is rarely an easy read. That's where these blinks come in. Focusing on the most interesting of the many philosophers highlighted by the author, these blinks present compelling ideas to live by in simple terms. Blink 1 of 7 Around 2,500 years ago, in the Greek city of Athens, an unclean and somewhat ugly man was regularly seen stopping strangers on the street. His name was Socrates, and he possessed one of the most brilliant minds in all of ancient Greece. Now, Socrates wasn't asking people for money. He was questioning Athenians about morality and the nature of truth, and he often found their answers to be one-dimensional and full of assumptions. Unfortunately, Socrates never wrote his ideas down though one of his students, Plato, did. Most of the Socratic dialogues, for example, were in fact written by Plato. But Plato was more than a mere transmitter of his teacher's thought. He was also a formidable philosopher in his own right. The key message here is, Socrates and Plato asked profound questions that set philosophy in motion. Plato is perhaps most famous for the allegory of the cave. In this parable, People unschooled in philosophic thought are likened to captives held in a cave. Facing the cave's wall, they mistake the shadows they see for real life. The philosopher, on the other hand, is different. He can escape the cave and observe the world as it really is. This parable ties in with Plato's theory of forms. According to this theory, every physical object has an underlying and ideal form. The physical objects themselves, however, are mere approximations of this form, just as shadows on a cave wall are approximations of the objects casting them. Most people are distracted by the physical things they encounter in the world, just as the captives are distracted by the shadows. But to really perceive reality, to truly exit the cave, we must use a thought, rather than just relying on our senses. For example, we know the characteristics of what makes a table a flat top, one or more legs. But we can't always grasp the true form of a table, that abstract quality of tableness that transcends the physical world. Similarly, we might describe actions as good, but rarely do we have a clear idea of what the abstract ideal or form of goodness is. The ability to think in terms of forms, Plato proposed, was a skill exclusive to philosophers. He even recommended that philosophers should run society because of their unique wisdom. But some Athenians didn't agree. They thought that philosophers were disrupting the city's traditions, encouraging youth to disobey authority and neglect the gods. In fact, many Athenians made these same accusations against Plato's mentor, Socrates. In the end, Socrates was found guilty of corrupting the young. As punishment, he was sentenced to drinking a lethal poison. But his questioning spirit has inspired philosophers ever since. Link 2 of 7 Some students spend their whole lives following in their teacher's footsteps. They investigate, strengthen, and develop those lines of thought laid down by their mentors. Others take a different approach. They strike it out on their own, discover new intellectual paths, and challenge many of their teacher's convictions. That's exactly what Aristotle did. He was one of Plato's students, but his philosophy broke new ground in some very important ways. In fact, 
his philosophical works came to be so highly regarded that thinkers accepted his arguments at face value for centuries. The authority associated with his name was enough for them not to investigate further. So just what made his thinking so distinctive? The key message here is, Aristotle's philosophy maps out a path to human flourishing. Whereas Plato thought the visible world was an inferior imitation of ideal forms, Aristotle paid great attention to the minutiae of everyday life. Much of his work is what we now think of as scientific, seeking to explain complex zoological and astronomical phenomena. One question that Aristotle dwelled on was the issue of how we should live. It was a question that Socrates and Plato tried to answer, but Aristotle formulated his own solution. We should seek happiness. Now, by happiness, Aristotle didn't mean momentary pleasure. He used a specific word, eudaimonia, which suggests something closer to the modern terms flourishing or success. Just as plants flourish under the right conditions, so do humans. And, as with plants, events outside our control can affect our flourishing. But how can we seek eudaimonia? Well, according to Aristotle, human beings have one function which sets them apart from all other creatures. That function is reason. By exercising our ability to reason, Aristotle thought, we could achieve a fulfilling and successful life. But Aristotle didn't stop there. He emphasized that increasing eudaimonia required a specific type of character, one distinguished by virtuous habits. In his philosophy, all virtues consist of a middle way between two opposing extremes. Take the virtue of courage, for example. To have too little courage is to be cowardly. To have too much is to be reckless. Halfway between these two extremes lies the real virtue that we need to practice. Blink three of seven. Most people don't like thinking about death. The idea that we'll die one day, and that our time on earth will eventually come to an end, is a daunting prospect for most of us. But not for Epicurus, another philosopher who lived in ancient Athens. According to him, being afraid of death simply made no sense. Why? In short, because humans never actually experience death. We die, of course, but we're not around to experience being dead after that, so it can't really bother us. Why should we fear something that we can't possibly feel or even be aware of? To drive this point home, Epicurus compares death to the time before we were born. Was that period scary and sad? Of course not. We simply weren't aware of anything. Which, according to Epicurus, is exactly how death will feel. The key message here is, Epicurus recommended fearlessness in the face of death, and a life of simple pleasures. Pleasure was at the heart of life for Epicurus. What drives us, he thought, is the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. For Epicurus, the best life contains the most pleasure and the least pain. But that didn't lead him to recommend a life of debauchery and hedonism. He recommended the opposite. Epicurus thought that we should try to restrain our desires and ambitions. That's why he emphasized the satisfaction that can be found in unassuming, common pleasures like friendship. This type of happiness is easy to achieve and doesn't depend on riches and good luck. It's available to everyone. Unfortunately, Epicurus's teachings developed a bad reputation over time. People forgot his emphasis on simple, wholesome pleasures. Rather, they thought that he'd recommend a life of cheap and shallow pleasure-seeking. That's what the word Epicurean suggests to most people today. Even in his lifetime, people distorted Epicurus's teachings. Rumours swirled that his philosophical community in Athens was a hotbed of immorality and sexual indulgence. But these accusations got his philosophy all wrong. What Epicurus recommended was a simple, ethical, and fulfilling life, enjoyed without any fear of death. And that remains a compelling message. Blink 4 of 7 Jean-Jacques Rousseau, an 18th-century thinker from Switzerland, 
has inspired revolutionaries for centuries. Perhaps his most famous line is, Man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. But what exactly did Rousseau mean by that? In what sense are modern humans unfree? And is there anything we can do to liberate ourselves? Well, according to Rousseau, people are naturally both free and good. Before society emerged, we lived as our instincts dictated, in harmony with both nature and others. But that changed when we left our natural environment and formed larger societies. Civilization ultimately led to corruption and the exploitation of the weak and poor. Or, in Rousseau's words, to the chains that restrain humankind. The key message here is, Rousseau sought to restore humans to a state of natural happiness. The question of how to undo this corruption occupied Rousseau for a long time. In 1762, he set out his solution in a work known as The Social Contract. In this book, Rousseau argued that society could be reorganised in a way that would allow people to be free and good once more. How? To answer that question, we need to examine one of Rousseau's philosophical advancements, the general will. The general will refers to whatever's in the interest of the entire community. If a decision promotes the welfare of all, then it's in accordance with the general will. If it conflicts with the welfare of all, then it goes against the general will. It's easy to think the general will is the same thing as the will of the majority, but it's fundamentally different. Look at it this way. A majority might vote to lower taxes for individual, selfish reasons. That might well be the will of the majority, but if it harms the community as a whole, it can't be the general will. Rousseau felt that a society attuned to the general will was capable of providing humans with real freedom. Instead of competing with each other for money and status, citizens would contribute to their community by obeying its laws and remain free at the same time. But there was one sinister side to this philosophy. According to Rousseau, any dissenters might sometimes have to be compelled to obey the general will. In his own words, they would be forced to be free, which translates to them being forced to do whatever benefits the community. After all, that's what Rousseau thought freedom was. Link 5 of 7 Imagine that you're walking home one day and you come across a badly beaten young man. You prop him up, give him some water and call an ambulance. Most people would say you acted morally. But according to the 18th century thinker Immanuel Kant, you might not have. In Kant's view, what matters isn't a person's actions, but the reason for those actions. For example, you might think you behaved virtuously if you helped out of a sense of compassion. Kant would disagree. In his conception of morality, duty, not pity, is used to measure virtue. According to Kant, a good deed done for emotional reasons isn't really a good deed at all. So how do we act morally then? The key message here is, Kant believed our actions are moral when we approve of the universal maxims they embody. Think of it this way. There are times in everyone's life when it would be advantageous to lie. Some days, for example, you might feel like calling in sick and taking a day off work when you're perfectly healthy. According to Kant, you should ask yourself a question first. Would it be good if everyone behaved like this? In this instance, you might make the question more specific and ask, would it be good if everyone lied when it suited them? If the answer is no, then Kant said you should avoid that behaviour yourself. In other words, Kant believed that we should pay attention to the principles, or maxims, motivating our actions. So, if you avoid lying, then you live by the maxim that people should never lie. Kant argued that you're being moral when you live by the maxims that you think everyone else should live by. If you'd be happy for the entire world to emulate your behaviour, then your behaviour is truly moral. That's why helping an injured stranger isn't necessarily moral from Kant's point of view. If you rescue a beaten man because you feel pity for him, you're not acting out of a sense of duty. But if you help him because you believe we should all help those in need, 
then you're honouring your duty to live in accordance with moral maxims. Blink 6 of 7 The life of Friedrich Nietzsche, a 19th century German philosopher, doesn't make for cheerful reading. A tremendously gifted young man, Nietzsche had to retire shortly after being made professor at the age of 24 due to ill health. After leaving his job at the university, Nietzsche spent years travelling Europe, writing books that almost nobody read at the time. And although his reputation began to improve in the final years of his life, Nietzsche never got to enjoy his fame. He suffered a total mental breakdown. His family ended up caring for him at home during the last decade of his life. By all standards, these were unfavourable circumstances. But Nietzsche's writings are some of the most powerful and morally challenging works in all of modern philosophy. The key message here is, Nietzsche showed that atheism undermines some of our most cherished moral assumptions. Nietzsche believed that his contemporaries hadn't grasped the true moral challenge brought on by the growth of atheism. He felt that most atheists maintained Christian values while claiming not to believe in a Christian God. With Christianity in decline, Nietzsche argued we could now assess its morality objectively, free from the shackles of religion. Shockingly, he insisted that kindness, tolerance and compassion are Christian values that couldn't be justified in the absence of the Christian faith. But he didn't stop there. Nietzsche also claimed that Christian values, like compassion and care for the weak, had surprisingly dishonourable roots. In societies like ancient Greece, beauty, strength and courage were the most valued characteristics. But the powerless resented these noble virtues, so they created their own out of envy. In fact, he suggested that it was the most downtrodden members of ancient societies, enslaved people, who established this envious outlook. That's why he referred to it as slave morality. Christianity, with its generosity and care for the weak, was a prime example of revolt against the inequitable virtues of the ancient world. In late 19th century Europe, Christianity was on the wane, and Nietzsche posed a fearsome challenge to his contemporaries. If you no longer believe in the Christian religion, you must also discard the values that derive from it. The slave morality embodied by Christianity had had its day, Nietzsche argued. What would come next was anyone's guess. Link 7 of 7 most thinkers have a fairly exalted view of philosophy. And why wouldn't they? They spend years of their lives addressing questions that have bewildered other philosophers for millennia. They try to tell us what truth is, what society should look like, and how we should all behave. On the surface, these seem like pretty worthwhile tasks. But the 20th century philosopher from Vienna, Ludwig Wittgenstein, was a different type of thinker. According to him, most philosophical problems are actually confusions. And instead of trying to resolve them, philosophers just need to disentangle themselves from the intellectual webs they've woven. It's a unique position, but that's hardly surprising. Wittgenstein was a unique man. So, what exactly were his beliefs? The key message here is, Wittgenstein sought to dissolve philosophical questions, not to answer them. According to Wittgenstein, a lot of philosophical problems crop up because thinkers get confused by the way we use language. Instead of trying to get at some kind of essential and unchanging root underlying concepts like justice, reality and the good, Wittgenstein proposed that we should think of words and language as tools to communicate things. Let's use as an example that ever-present question, what is truth? According to Wittgenstein, we shouldn't answer this question as a philosopher normally would, with an elaborate and confusing account of truth with a capital T. Wittgenstein emphasised that we should simply attend to the word truth as people use it in various contexts, or, to use Wittgenstein's term, in various language games. So in order to answer the question of what truth is, all you need to do is point out the way the word truth is actually used. 
That's what truth really is, according to Wittgenstein. Once we learn to look at philosophical problems in this way, many of them simply vanish. After all, we were creating the problems ourselves by misunderstanding language. So where does that leave Wittgenstein? What does a philosopher do when he thinks most philosophical questions are insignificant confusions? Well, Wittgenstein thought of himself as a kind of philosophical therapist. His job, he thought, was to help lead philosophers out of the confusion they created. He said that most philosophers got caught in their questions, like flies trapped in a bottle. What he aimed to do was to remove the cork and let them out. You've just listened to our blinks to A Little History of Philosophy by Nigel Warburton. The key message in these blinks is that for thousands of years, humans have been asking difficult questions about the world, life, and virtuous behaviour. So far, there's never been any real consensus about the answers, and many of these vexing philosophical questions still go unresolved. Nevertheless, the ideas proposed over two and a half millennia are by turns consoling, awe-inspiring, and challenging.